Welcome back. This is the third in a series of sessions I've done in Apple and Amazon. And these sessions were triggered by the two companies' market capitalizations crossing a trillion. In the first of the three sessions, I looked at why a trillion dollars might make a difference. Why does crossing a number, after all, a trillion dollars is an arbitrary number, why not 999 million, might make a difference to how you think about the companies. In the second session, I valued the companies. And reviewing the valuations, here's what I found. I found Apple to be overvalued by about 9 to 10%. I valued it at about 200, the stock was trading at 220. And Amazon to be overvalued by about, if you look at its price, price of 1,950 when I valued it, I valued about 1,255, about 35% lower than the market price or about a 53% overvaluation. I, at the end of that session, I, I said I'd come back with a teaser. I said I'd come back and give you my investment judgments, which after all seem obvious, right? If I found both companies to be overvalued, I should be selling short right away. But I said there were two loose ends I wanted to tie up before I made that judgment. The first was I wanted to look at the uncertainty inherent in both my valuations and get more comfortable with my decision. And second, I wanted to talk a little bit about the catalyst that I might need to make money, even if I'm right. So let's start with uncertainty. As I've often repeated before, uncertainty in valuation is a feature, not a bug. You can't hide from it. You can't deny it. It is there and you've got to face up to it. And it's there in all your numbers. But when we do valuation often, we don't deal with it explicitly except in the discount rate. If you look at my valuations of Apple and Amazon, the only place I directly confront uncertainty, and even there it's opaque, is in the discount rate. My cash flows, my growth rates, my revenues are all estimates, but I've not really dealt with the uncertainty in those numbers explicitly. And that is something we tend to do in traditional valuation. That said though, the, po the process by which we value companies, which is using point estimates, well, and you know what I mean by point estimates, right? I use one revenue growth rate, 15% revenue growth rate for Amazon, a 3% revenue growth rate for Apple, one target margin, one cost of capital, is in a sense not really right because we are uncertain about all of those numbers. Now, 30 years ago, your excuse might have been, hey, what else can I do? I don't have the tools to bring in uncertainty. Today that excuse rings hollow and here's why. There are techniques and statistics and probability that I think can help us deal with uncertainty in a much healthier way. I have a paper I've linked up to this particular session that you can look at that looks at these techniques in more detail. But broadly speaking, there are three broad approaches I find useful in valuation. The first is scenario analysis. If you have a company where you potentially can have a different valuation of a company depending on a, on a scenario unfolding or two scenarios unfolding, you can value the company under two scenarios. I'll give you a simple example. Let's assume you have a company which gets 60% of its revenues from one customer, big customer. If it loses that customer, its value is going to be much lower, right? And it's very difficult to incorporate that all into one valuation. So why not value the company twice? once with the customer, once without, then estimate a likelihood for those two scenarios unfolding and value the company across those two scenarios. That is traditional scenario analysis and I use it to deal with discrete risks, risks like distress and nationalization, which I want to bring into my valuation. The second technique in probability that can help us is decision trees. This is particularly useful when you have sequential risk. What is sequential risk? You've got to live through one risk phase to get to the other one. So let's talk about a very simple example. You have a young drug company with a promising drug working its way through the pipeline. It could become a valuable company, right? But for that to happen, here's what it has to do. It has to get through each stage in the FDA approval process, succeed before becoming a commercial product. You can deal with that uncertainty much better by using decision trees than by trying to pump it all into the discount rate. And there's a third approach, and this is perhaps the most general way of dealing with uncertainty. Remember those estimates I made for Apple and Amazon? Not only are my estimates of revenue growth and margins that I use for these companies and cost of capital and, uh, estimates, they could be wrong, they, and I could be wrong on them. The errors I make on those numbers could be correlated with each other. What am I talking about? Let's take Amazon. My revenue growth rate that I've used for my base case valuation is 15%. My target operating margin is 12.5%. Not only can I be wrong on both those numbers, but I'm wrong on those numbers. I'm probably going to be wrong in the same direction. 
In other words, when Amazon's revenue growth drops below my expectations, the kinds of bad things that cause that to happen will probably also cause its margins to be lower than expected. So when you have multiple sources of uncertainty, and they can be correlated, simulations can help you. I think that is perhaps the best technique that I can use for Apple and Amazon because that is the kind of uncertainty I feel. So let me start with my Apple simulation. Let me take the three variables that I focused on in the simulation. You think, why do you stop at three? Why not make every single input into a distribution? Less is more. Focus on the variables that matter, not the variables that you don't control. In this case, here are the three numbers I build distributions around. The first was the growth rate in revenues. If you remember, in my base case, I used a 3% growth rate. But with the pricing of the new iPhones, let's assume that that market share for Apple drops and that revenue growth drops to 0%. That's my worst case scenario. And in the best case scenario, perhaps people will overlook the high prices and maybe Apple can make more money on Apple services and with new products, which translate into a 6% growth rate. So my revenue growth can be a number between zero and six. And since I feel pretty diffuse about where it will fall, I'm gonna make it a uniform distribution. Roughly an equal chance of revenue growth, growth falling anywhere between zero and 6%. With my operating margin, my base case margin is 25%. That's a drop of about 4% to 5% from existing margins. That's because I think competition will heat up. But let's say that competition turns out to be even stronger than expected. That might cause margins to drop even further, and I'm gonna use 20% as my lowest margin. And if Apple's able to maintain its pricing power, maybe it can keep margins at 30%. Here I feel more connected to that 25% base case as the most likely scenario. So I use what's called a triangular distribution, centered around 25%, but with a low number of 20 and a high number of 30. And finally, with the cost of capital, I used an 8.2% cost of capital. Could I be wrong? Yes, but I don't think I'm gonna be wrong by much. This is a mature company where I know a great deal about the company. You think, what if T-bond rates change and risk premiums change? I'm not gonna to try to bring that into this valuation. Those are market timing issues and I want to keep this about Apple. So if there are changes in this cost of capital, it's because I've misestimated the risk of Apple's businesses or that Apple could enter into a new business. So I'm gonna allow for a distribution of the cost of capital, but a fairly tight one. So I use a normal distribution where the standard, the standard deviation of my cost of capital is about 0.4%. So here's what I do. I run 100,000 simulations. Effectively, I'm pulling numbers, outcomes out of each of these three distributions and valuing the company. What do I get? I get a remarkably symmetric distribution centered around $200. Remember in my base case, I valued Apple at about $200. My, my simulations back up that value. The median value across the simulations is about 200. But there's some interesting additional statistics that I can, I can find here. The first is you can see the minimum, the lowest and the highest values, which I don't think are that useful. Your worst case and your best case scenarios are never great ways to drive your investment decision. Instead, I'm gonna focus on the 10th and the 90th percentile, which is a pretty wide range. And Apple, if I look at the 10th and the 90th percentile, has a value between $176 and $229. That's a pretty tight range for 80% of the values to fall in. So that was my Apple simulation. With Amazon, I ran a simulation around the same three variables I used for Apple, but I added a third variable, a fourth variable, which was sales to invested capital. For those of you myst mystified by this number, this is my proxy for how efficiently the company is able to deliver its growth. The higher this number, the more efficiently the company is delivering growth. Right now, Amazon is doing a really good job in terms of being efficient in capital. For every dollar of capital it invests, it gets about $5.95 in revenues. That could, of course, change. In fact, with all four of my inputs, notice I feel a lot more uncertain about the future there with Amazon than with Apple. You're saying, why don't you do more homework? Well, homework is not gonna help me. The reason I feel more uncertain about the future with Amazon is my story for Amazon is that it's a disruption machine looking for businesses to disrupt, which means I have no idea what new business it's going to go into, and it's going to show up as a much wider range on every single one of my inputs. My revenue growth, for instance, has, a, has an expected value of 15%. That's my base case number, but could be as low as 5% if regulators and antitrust uh, you know, enforcers have their way, or to be high as 25%, Amazon has shown this capacity to beat, to beat expectations. 
Now, before you look at the zero, the five, 15 and 25 and say, hey, that's not a big difference. At a 15% growth rate, Amazon's revenues 10 years from now are about 600 billion. At a 25% growth rate, there are 1.1 trillion. No company in history has even come close to those revenues. And at a 5% growth rate, there are about three, so at 300 billion. So there's a huge spread in the final revenues. So I'm, I'm getting, I'm uncertain about the future and I'm reflecting that in that distribution. My operating margin, my base case was 12.5%. But here again, I feel pretty uncertain about what the future will, will deliver. Maybe Amazon will be unable to improve its margins and stay stuck at today's margins, which are about 7% if you incorporate their technology costs as a capital expenditure. But maybe, maybe <clears throat> they can find ways to control logistics costs and enter more profitable businesses, in which case the margin could be much higher, 15, 16%. So you can see the spread in margins reflects my uncertainty about where Amazon is going to go in the future. For the sales invested cap, <clears throat> I build around the 5.95 as my base case, but to the extent that they decide to enter businesses that are more capital intensive, that number drops to 3.95 or less capital intensive, 7.95. Finally, on the cost of capital, I've given Amazon a pretty low cost of capital, 7.97% cost of capital. That's close to the median for global companies. So could it fall? Yes, but I think there's a much greater chance that I've underestimated the cost of capital than overestimated, and you can see it in the tail of the distribution. I allow for much higher cost of capital more than I allow for much lower cost of capital. I run the simulations again. Here again, the median delivers a value very close to my base case, which shouldn't be a surprise because I'm making similar, ba similar base assumptions in the two. My base case was $1,255. My median value is $1,242. That's pretty close. But it's in the range that you see the difference. If I take the 10th and the 90th percentile, like I did for Apple, the range I get is between $700 and $2,132. So let's see how we can use these simulations to make more informed investment judgments. When I run a simulation, I'm not doing it because I want a better estimate of value. In fact, as you saw from these simulations, my median across the simulations is pretty close to my base case. So I'm not doing this to get a better estimate of value. I'm not even doing this as a measure of risk because if you look at the spread of the distributions, it's true, Amazon looks more risky than Apple, but much of the risk that I face with Amazon is estimation risk because I'm not sure what the company will do in the future. You're saying, so what? To the extent that I don't let Amazon become 50, 60% of my portfolio. If I'm a diversified investor, that kind of risk should even out across my portfolio. So it is, if it's a risk proxy, it's more of a risk proxy if you're a concentrated investor, owns three or four or five companies rather than 30 or 40 or 50. Third, these simulations also illustrate to us one of the dangers of a technique that a lot of value investors put their, put their weight behind, which is the margin of safety. The margin of safety is a number that value investors often use to decide whether to buy shares. And one of the things that I've, I've always found troubling about the margin of safety is the absolute rules of thumb that I see people carrying around. Maybe this is not true for all value investors, but some value investors use a margin of safety of, let's say, 15%. You think, so what? Well, you can see from an Apple and Amazon simulations that 15% might be too large, if you look at Apple, might be a margin of safety that is too large given the fact that the, the range for Apple is so tight that maybe the margin of safety I, I need is much smaller for Apple and much larger for Amazon because there is so much uncertainty in the future. If you're going to use a margin of safety, maybe simulations can let, give you a much better way of adapting what it should be for different companies. And finally, I'm going to say something that you've probably forgotten from your statistics class. Remember when we talk about distributions, we talk about symmetric distributions like the normal distribution and asymmetric distributions. You probably heard that in your statistics class and said, who cares? When you look at Apple and Amazon, I'm going to argue that perhaps you should care as an investor. And here's why. My Apple distribution is pretty symmetric. My Amazon distribution is not just asymmetric. It's got a tail sticking out on the positive side. In other words, the chances of big positive outcomes are greater than the chances of big negative outcomes. If you have a company with potentially dangerous or disruptive things that could ruin the company hang out there in the future, you could get a distribution with a negative skewness where, the, where you have a greater chance of big negative outcomes and positive outcomes as an investor. If you're long on a stock, you'd much rather be long on a stock 
with a long positive tail like Amazon. If you're selling short, you'd much rather sell short in a stock with a big negative tail. That's neither here nor there. We'll come back and use this in making our final decisions on Apple and Amazon. So what are the implications of these simulations for Apple and Amazon? Now, initially, when I sat down to run these simulations, remember, I started with the premise from my base case that Apple was overvalued by about 10 percent and Amazon was overvalued by about 55 percent if you compare the, 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 the price to the value. There is roughly, but if you look at the simulations with both stocks, there's roughly a 15 to 20 percent chance with both stocks that the stocks are undervalued rather than overvalued. In other words, there's a 15 to 20 percent chance that I'm wrong with both stocks, even though Apple looks far less overvalued than Amazon. Secondly, with Amazon, if I sell short, there is that added risk of that long positive tail. In other words, if I'm wrong on Amazon, I'm far more likely to lose a lot of money than I am with Apple. So the bottom line is once you run the simulations, the gap between the two companies narrows. I start out with the premise that Apple was a much worse target for short selling than Amazon. I might, I might conclude with that, but the, the, the difference between the two companies has narrowed because the chance of me losing money is the same with both companies. And if I lose money, I'm far more likely to lose money with lose a lot of money with Amazon than with Apple. So file that away because it's going to become part of my final decision process. So now let's talk about catalyst. Remember again, I'm going to go back to a theme that I've talked about before. There's a value process that delivers value. There's a pricing process that delivers price. And there's a difference between the two. And I call it the gap. For you to make money as an investor, the gap has to close. But it doesn't, there is no hallelujah moment where this happens, where you wake up and say, oh my God, there's a gap and it closes. There's got to be a catalyst. Something causes it to close. And it remains a mystery as to what that specific catalyst. But broadly speaking, when you look at companies, there are four groups of catalysts that you can see that can cause the gap to close that are not coming from pure pricing catalysts like technical indicators. The first is an earnings report from the company. Perhaps an earnings report from a company can deliver information that's so contrary to the expectations that people pricing the stock have built in that the price might adjust. So if investors are over, uh, overestimating expected growth, maybe an earnings report that delivers much lower growth may be the moment where they sober up and the gap closes. So it could be an earnings report. And this is especially true for companies that don't script their earnings very well. Secondly, it could be corporate news of what an acquisition, a divestiture, it could be a new product, it could be a update on an existing product where people take another look at the company and say, hey, maybe what I thought about the company was wrong. Let me reassess the price and the gap closes. It could be something coming from management, a change in management, a misstep by management, a management scandal, and all of those things can feed into the gap closing. And finally, it could be a macro story. It could be the fact that um, the regulators change the rules for the company. It could be an antitrust, author, you know, antitrust action against a company. It could be any of those things causing the gap. So when you invest, you're looking for gaps. And as an investor, I always look for catalysts. But I'm more focused on finding them when I'm selling short than going long. You're saying, why? When I go long on a stock, I control my own time horizon. Perhaps it's because I'm investing my own money. It might be different if I were a portfolio manager having to answer to clients. And because I'm investing my own money, I can wait and wait and wait. And be unless I have a liquidity need, I can wait for as long as it takes for the catalyst to show up, for the change to happen. So I'm less focused on is there an impending catalyst when I'm going long than when I sell short. Because here's what happens when I sell short. I'm borrowing somebody else's shares and selling them, right? Promising to re return them, which effectively means when I sell short, I control my time horizon far less. So when I sell short, I need a catalyst, kind of at least in the near term. And by near term, I'm not saying in the next week, the next month, something that'll happen that'll cause the gap to close before I'm forced to close out my position. Put differently, if I bet on a company being overvalued and I'm right in my thesis and I sell short, I can go bankrupt if a catalyst doesn't show up in the time period before I have to close out my position. So if you're worried about catalysts, you should be far more worried about them when you're short on a stock than when you're long. So it's decision time in Apple and Amazon. Let's bring together the facts. 
So let's start with the market price. This is Friday on September 21st. Here's what the numbers look like. Apple was trading at the start of Friday at $220 per share. Amazon was trading at $19.50. My base case valuation of the two companies, $201 for Apple, $1,255 for Amazon. And if I look at the, at the, at the price divided by the value, to look at the percentage over or under value, that the, the price is over or under value, with Apple, I get about 9.5% that the price is overvalued. And with Amazon, I get a 55.4% that price is overvalued. If I break down the simulation results, here's what I get. I get a pretty tight range for Apple, 176 to 29, a much bigger range for Amazon. I do find a much more symmetric distribution for Apple, which I measure with what's called a skewness, which tells you how symmetric the distribution is. Normal distribution is zero skewness, but you can see that Amazon is much more positively skewed, greater chance of big positive outliers than big negative ones. When I look at the gap catalyst, Apple and Amazon are both very good companies at managing expectations. Their earnings are incredibly well scripted, which means that they manage expectations and usually deliver close to expectations. In fact, they've trained markets to expect different things. Apple, when you look at earnings reports, the focus is usually on iPhone growth and operating margins, the level of margins. Amazon, on the other hand, the focus is on revenue growth overall and improvements in margins. In fact, they've trained the market to look beyond the fact that the margins are still low at pointing to the improvement in margins. And they've done this very well. So I think it's very unlikely that you're going to see an earnings report from either company that is such a major surprise that it's going to be the catalyst. You say, what about corporate actions? Apple has set itself up for catalysts that show up every year or two. And here's why. The fact that it gets so much of its revenues and profits from the iPhone, where it has to reinvent itself, come up with a new update, which means that every time Apple comes out with a new update, a new iPhone, it's an event where markets take a look, another look at Apple and perhaps that can be the catalyst. And that is you know, magnified by the fact that Apple has made these, these occasions where it announces these updates into major events. This is the Steve Jobs legacy, which is these huge events where Apple announces products. So in a sense with Apple, you have a greater chance of catalyst than with Amazon, where new products come in under the radar. You seldom see Amazon making a big deal about its new products and calling notice to them. What about management? Both Apple and Amazon have you know, established CEOs who are very disciplined about how they run their companies. You're not going to get tweets from these CEOs that are going to cause major changes in the company. There, it's, So I don't see much likelihood that you're going to see, you know, at least you know, in the foreseeable future, that the managers are going to, in these companies are going to be the catalyst for change which leaves us with macro events. With Apple, those macro events, I don't see as major ones, except for China. And here's where China matters. It, it is probably Apple's biggest growth market, and Apple is getting an increasing percentage of its revenues from China. To the extent that the US trade war with China becomes more, more problematic before it gets solved, that could affect Apple. But I think it is a relatively small catalyst, relatively small, at least a smaller problem than what Amazon faces. What I, what you've seen, you know that what Amazon's success has done is it's drawn attention, drawn attention from its competitors, which is not a bad thing, and it's terrified the competitors. But it's also drawn attention from regulators and antitrust authorities. I'm not saying any action is imminent, but I think Amazon now has a target on its back. That target may be, may be fair, it might not be unfair, but it's there. And to me, that is a catalyst that has not existed for much of Amazon's life. And, to, and that catalyst could potentially be the force that slows the company down in ways a competitor never could. So how does this all play out with Apple? I looked at the numbers and I sold my existing stake in Apple. I already own shares in Apple and I think it's overvalued enough that I need to leave the stock. Not permanently, I'll be back because with Apple, this has been a back and forth. I've been, I've bought Apple four times in the last seven years. I've sold Apple four times and this is my most recent sale. I have not sold short on Apple, but if the stock gets to 230, which is roughly my 90th percentile, I put in a limit order to sell. That way it's out of my hands and it'll happen automatically. I love the company too much to actually go in and physically put a short sale. 
with Amazon, another company I absolutely admire. I'm going to do something I've not done in 20 years. I'm going to sell short at the nine, and I did at the $1,950 price at the start of today. I'm doing it because I think that Amazon has drawn attention for or that, that there is a potential catalyst for Amazon in the form of regulatory and antitrust changes that it's never faced before. And that change, I think, could be a force that could be the catalyst that causes the, the adjustment of price to value. So time will tell. And with both companies, I'm doing this with open eyes. So I've sold my shares. And as I've said, I've got that limit short sale at 230. With Amazon, I've sold short at 1950 And I do this with the recognition that this is perhaps one of the best run companies in the world. I have huge amounts of admiration for the way Amazon has built itself up. And I think Jeff Bezos has run the company incredibly well. So this, I think, is a classic example of loving the company but not liking it as an investment. I, you know, Amazon's history is it's taken short sellers to the graveyard, and I hope that I'm not in that graveyard in the next year or two. But here's my redeeming, redeeming grace. Amazon is not going to be 50% of my portfolio. So I've sold short, but I've sold short in a quantity where I can live with a mistake. I hope I've not made that mistake, but I can live with that mistake. I'm not going to lose sleep over either decision, but I've never believed in losing sleep over any investment decision. Thank you very much for listening in, and I hope you've enjoyed this session.